Hey, thanks for joining us today. Here in our channel, you can catch all of our messages and live services. And our hope is that you would experience the presence of God in a very real and tangible way. That's right. And if you want to make sure that you never miss a message again, all you need to do is hit the subscribe button below this video. jump into this um, series because we are, uh, what we do here at Crossroads, if you're newer at Crossroads, uh, you know, um, you know, there's some churches that kind of focus on, their, they're like, there's this one way of preaching, there's only one way of preaching, and whether you preach through the scriptures verse by verse, or if you preach topically or whatever. And, you know, the great thing is, is that scripture doesn't tell us uh, the best way to do it. People just kind of come up with what they think is the best, and they, they, um, make that the thing, whatever. But so what we try to do here at Crossroads is try to have a good mix. And um, so what we're going to be doing, because there's benefits, there's pros and challenges to both uh, styles, whether you're topically preaching or you're, or you're preaching through scripture. But, uh, but we try to do at least one time a year where we take one of the books of the Bible and really just take time and preach through that. And uh, there, there's a couple goals uh, of this, there's, I mean, there's a lot of benefits, but there's a couple goals that we have. Number one is my hope, and as we go through Scripture, and is that uh, I, I hope that part of what the team is doing is teaching us how to read and interpret Scripture in context, and as we consider Scripture as a whole, that there's no verse that's kind of a standalone verse, and you know, people kind of do that, don't they? We, I mean, we're all guilty of it at some point. We kind of take a verse, we pull it out of the original meaning. Why? Because it really helps us understand or makes us, makes us feel good about where we are. It really reinforces our belief or our point. And, and what I love about preaching through a book is it kind of helps us not see Scripture through our lens, but it changes our lens to see it through scriptural lenses, if that makes sense. So that's one of the goals. And, and then another of the goals that we have is, to, is really to raise up and teach more teachers and preachers. So, so we're actually going to have six different uh, speakers as we go through 12 weeks uh, on Galatians. And we've been working behind the scenes uh, for about two months now, three months on digging into this and breaking it up and how does this go and what do we feel like God is speaking overall over the entire series. And so there's a lot of this going on behind the scenes. So not only do we want like a great Sunday service, but what's happening underneath the surface of the church, I think is actually more important than what we experience on a Sunday morning. Amen. And in fact, if you never, if, if, if you're kind of newer here at Crossroads, uh, you know, one thing to really understand about us as a church is, of course, we want a great Sunday morning. Of course, we want, like, when people come in and all of us come in and that there's a, you know, there's nothing like worshiping to bad worship, right? So we want good worship and we want, like, and we want a, a message that's, that's impactful and full of the Holy Spirit. But, but there's so much else that happens in the church. At least there should be. You know, the development and the teaching and the discipling and all of that stuff that happens outside of a Sunday morning, that includes growth groups, it includes youth and students. And by the way, uh, I heard that students, second service, uh, there's so many students showing up that they can't shut the door now of the room because there's so many kids all sitting on the floor. So, um, so we got to figure out our, those, our, our room situation. But, but all of that stuff's happening. Friday nights, the students are showing up. They're bringing their unsaved friends. They're, they're coming and they're, they're experiencing God. They're, they're having fun together. All of that stuff to say that this is one small piece of the life of the church. And that's good news, by the way. That's good news. So each week's going to be a little bit different. And... Um, you know, some weeks we're going to cover a few verses, and then other weeks we'll cover a big chunk. And, you know, the way what we saw and what we felt like God was leading us uh, to do. So, so I'm going to start this week with Ephesians, or I'm sorry, Galatians. Uh, boy, that would be horrible, wouldn't it? <laughs> start in the wrong book. Uh, so we're, this is a study on Galatians. Galatians. And we're going to do Galatians 1, 1 through 5 today. So I'm going to read it out loud if you want to follow along. It says, this letter is from Paul, an apostle. I was not appointed by any group of people or any human authority, 
but by Jesus Christ himself and by God the Father who raised Jesus from the dead. All the brothers and sisters here join me in sending this letter to the churches of Galatia. May God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Jesus gave his life for our sins just as God our Father planned in order to rescue us from this evil world in which we live. All glory to God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the grace that you give us to be changed and impacted by the power of your word. So Lord, today we just invite you, Holy Spirit, would you come, would you speak so deeply into our situations, into our lives, into our hearts. And God, I pray that through this entire series that you would just illuminate this, pass- this, this book, that God, that, that it, would, it would develop so much uh, character and discipleship in us, Lord. So we give you glory and we give it all to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So yeah, so today I have the honor of introducing this book and, and introducing the series. So my hope today is that I can help frame up uh, what this whole series is going to be about. And my prayer over this series is that, that throughout these weeks that we're preaching and we're, we're teaching and we're digging in, is that we read and we learn and we really embody about the undeserved grace of God that each one of us would be impacted greatly by the love of God. Because I firmly believe this truth, that no one can stay the same once they encounter the love of God. And if I was to write a thesis of Galatians, this is what I would probably write, is that there is no one when they encounter the true, powerful, unadulterated, undeserved love of God, no one can stay the same. This is why we call this series Radical Freedom. That if you look into Galatians, that ultimately it's speaking to a freedom that's not just like, hey, I, God made me happy today, or God, you know, I tithe and God made me rich, or it's not like any of these like little superficial things, but the depth of God's love, the depth of God's grace, and how it fundamentally calls us to a different life, to be new people, a new creation, citizens of a new world, that there's newness that comes not off of our effort, but off of God's effort. Because of what he's already done, the door is open. My prayer is that each and every person, that as we encounter the love of God, that we encounter the grace of and mercy of God, that we experience the radical freedom of Christ. And whether you're watching online, or whether you're here, whether you're watching the YouTube channel, or whatever, you're watching Facebook, or you know, Tiki Talkie, whatever it is, I pray that the Holy Spirit would really open up our hearts to see the beauty of Christ, to see the beauty of what He's done that it would bring us back, if you've been in this journey for a long time, that it would bring you back to your first love, remind you of why you got into this in the first place, remind you of that radical freedom that you needed and Christ provided, and that it would also open your eyes to those around you that need that same freedom. So as we kick off today, let me... um, let me start this, this series by giving some background of why Paul was writing this letter in the first place. So we read in, in Acts 13 and 14, we read about Paul and Barnabas. They, they headed over, they left, uh, uh, they left Israel and they, they, they went up from Antioch up to um, Galatia. And they actually... In those two chapters, they, they visited city after city. Some of the cities that went well, they started churches. Other cities, he got stoned and left for dead and had to be raised again. You know, I mean, just normal missionary stuff. And, um, but as he traveled through, he was establishing some churches. So 
while most of Paul's books are written to a specific church, Galatians is actually written to a group of churches. It's a, 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 a group. So, so, in fact, Galatia is, was the center of what is now modern-day Turkey. If we have that map, we can, we can take a look at that. These are the missionary journeys, but you see in the green, that was Galatia. So in the bottom part of Galatia, sorry, it's a little blurry in the middle, but at the bottom uh, part of Galatia, you have four churches that they had planted, and those were the churches. So he, this book was not just to one church, it was actually to a group of churches. And this book was actually written because there was a problem. Like they, they would establish the elders, they would establish the leadership team, they would establish everything that the, the church needed as a healthy, functioning church of Jesus Christ, and then they would move to the next city. So as they were going to the next city and the next city, what would happen is there was this group of people called the Judaizers that would come behind them. And this group of people, they would travel to all of these churches, and they would teach that, that the Gentiles needed to not just follow Jesus, but they actually had to follow all the laws of Moses as well. So they would come along and they would try to Judaize them. They would try to make them practicing Jews along with following Jesus. So this became a big problem. So, so what happened is, is, is in Acts 15, we see that Paul starts to confront some of this teaching and let's read in verse 15, it starts in verse 1. It says, While Paul and Barnabas were at Antioch of Syria, some men from Judea be arrived and began to teach the believers. Unless you are circumcised as required by the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. Paul and Barnabas disagreed with them, arguing, I love this word, vehemently. Like this was not like, well, we'll just agree to disagree. This was not an issue of, of, you know, we just see this differently. You know, well, you read the NIV, I read out of the King James. We just see it a little bit different. It's not this. Like, and, 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 and the reason I'm, I'm making a point is you'll see the reason for this is because of what Paul writes in the book of Galatians is so fundamental to our faith. He says they were arguing vehemently. Finally, the church decided to send Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem. So, you know, so imagine these Judaizers are, are on one side, and you got Paul and Barnabas on the other side, and the church is stuck in the middle. And these guys are going, no, 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 this is what it means to follow Jesus as a Gentile. And Paul and Barnabas are like, no, 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 they're wrong. Don't you listen to them. They're fools. Like, yeah, listen to us. And finally, the church is like, listen, y'all go to Jerusalem and get this figured out. We're confused. I mean, this is what's happening, right? So, so what happens after this is that they go to Jerusalem, and starting in verse 4, it says, When they arrived in Jerusalem, Barnabas and Paul were welcomed by the whole church, including the apostles and elders. They reported everything God had done through them. But then some of the believers that belonged to the sect of the Pharisees stood up and insisted that the Gentiles con con the Gentile converts must be circumcised and required to follow the law of Moses. Verse 6, so the apostles and elders met together to resolve this issue. At the meeting, after a long discussion, Peter stood and addressed them as, fol as follows. Brothers, you all know that God chose me from among you some time ago to preach to the Gentiles so they could hear the good news and believe. God knows people's hearts. And he confirmed that he accepts Gentiles by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, for he cleansed their hearts through faith. So why are you now challenging God by burdening the Gentile believers with a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors were able to bear? We believe that we are all saved the same way, by the undeserved grace of the Lord Jesus. Everybody say undeserved grace. Now the reason that this is really important is because this hits at the very core of most of our struggles when it comes to our relationship with the grace of God. In Galatians, 
we read, Paul said, he started the passage out by saying, all the brothers and sisters here join me in sending this letter to the churches of Galatia. In other words, Paul's saying that the Judaizers are trying to make it me against them. But you need to understand all of the church leaders are united in this issue. I have Peter on my side. So he, he's kind of doing a, if you know the Enneagram, he's a three, so he has to win. So I'm, sorry, I'm convinced that he's a three. So he says, hey, listen, what I'm about ready to talk about, you need to understand everything that I'm going to write. This is not just Paul having a wild hair. This is something that the whole council has talked about. All of the church leaders are here as I write this. So you need to listen up. So stop making it about uh, just a difference of opinion. Stop making it about this is fundamental to our faith. And he says, at its core, the book of Galatians wrestles with something that we all wrestle with. And it's this fact that the undeserved grace of God just seems too easy. Doesn't it? It just seems cheap at eye level. At surface level, the undeserved grace of God, it just seems too easy. I've had many, many conversations with people that go, so when, uh, anytime we talk about the grace of God, it's someone will come and they have an example. Well, what about Hitler? Would he receive that same grace of God? Well, according to Scripture, if he was to repent and give his life to Jesus, yes. And, and the reason that I go so far extreme is because that means there's room for you. Hopefully. I hope so. Because if not, then this whole thing's a sham. You know what I mean? So, but the reality is, is we can actually, we can, we can look at like the extreme examples, and then we look at us. And usually with us, we either have pride, and we think, well, we're, God's lucky to have us on his team, or, or we actually think so low of ourselves that, oh, no, you don't know what I've done, Joel. And sometimes that's the same person. <laughs> Depends on the day. This is why this foundation of unchanging, undeserved grace is the foundation of our faith. It is the bedrock. It's what keeps our days from being shifting sands, depending on what we experience. It, it, it's what allows our highs and our lows to still keep us moving. It's the thing that, it, it, whether our emotions are in it or our emotions are not in it, it keeps a bedrock and a steadiness to our walk with God. That for others, it just feels cheap sometimes. The undeserved grace of God. That, that there's something in us that just feels like we have to do something to earn it. Like, like, like just, I, I just need a win. Don't give me a, a participation trophy. Just let me win something. Even if you make it like Fake. Just give me some hurdle to jump over so that I can say I earned it. And God says, no, because it's not about you. And, 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 and ultimately, in Galatians, Paul then starts to break out over, over five chapters, six chapters, the, this, the beauty of the depth of God's grace, the undeserved grace, and then what is our response to it? Because it's not that it's just this take it or leave it undeserved grace that's always going to be there. It is an undeserved grace that demands a response. So it's not something that we're haphazard to or lazadaisical about, but it is something that at the end of the day, we have to understand that we cannot earn this grace. This is why Paul then in verse 3 says, May God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ give you, what is those words? Grace and, in other words, it's his to give. It's not yours to take. It's not yours to earn. There's not some bank account of grace that you better grab it while it's there. It's an unlimited fountain. It's his. He chooses to give it. He chooses to decide if you're qualified or not. See, because, you know, like when you have one piece of, let's say you have three kids, hypothetically speaking, and uh, you have one piece of candy. 
you get to choose. They can make their case, but at the end of the day, you choose. It's your candy. You can choose if you give it to one. You can choose if you split it up into three. You can choose you don't like their attitude and none of them get it, right? <laughs> but whatever it is, the choice is yours because you are the owner of it and you're the one that gets to choose to give it away. It's the same way with God. It's his, he gives. And as Paul is talking about the grace of God, there's a few things that we have to understand about this. The first thing that he really shows us is that the grace of God, the gospel is free. That the gospel is free. It is good news that God the Son accomplished our salvation. That it's already won. It's already there. He won. By the way, if you haven't got to the end of the book, he wins. <laughs> and his invitation to us is to join him in victory, in freedom, in salvation. That that is the invitation, that you don't work to win the battle. He's already won it. You are, the invitation is now to take that grace. And in fact, I would say that we malign the, the gospel when we try to add to grace. And this is what the essence of what all of Galatians, it's a response to a bunch of religious zealots coming into the church of the Gentiles and telling them that undeserved grace is cheap. It's too easy. You need to earn it. And I love what, what Peter actually said in Acts 15. He says, why are you guys trying to add the laws that even we couldn't live up to? What, like, seriously? You're trying to add to them the burden that we carried for thousands of years? And finally, we have a Savior that has freed us from that burden, and now you're going to come back in and try to burden them again. That's what religion does. Religion adds burden. It adds a yoke. It adds you must do dot, dot, dot. That's what religion does. Now, this doesn't mean that there's no responsibilities in following Jesus, but it's the difference is a heart posture. If you follow Jesus in all the things that he's called you to do, because the New Testament is full of commands that Jesus' followers are to live by. So it's not that it's just cheap grace, you get to do whatever you want to do, you just do this and you be you boo and you, live only, you only live once and so just go out and be a wild child and whatever and don't worry, that grace is available for you anytime you need it. Just come back like the prodigal son and he'll just give you the grace and it's so amazing. That's not what he's saying at all. He's actually saying you need to understand that this undeserved grace is so powerful, why wouldn't you want to live for him? Because there ain't no drug, there is no girl, there's no guy, there's no job, there's no company you've worked for, there's no government, there's no politician, there's no pastor that's died for you. So there's only one that's died for you. Isn't he worthy to live for? And that's Paul's thesis of Galatians. You know, this is why, the, you know, if you've been in this for a long time and it just feels like people take advantage of God's grace, you, it just feels like, you know, they're kind of like the, the, the dog that returns to its vomit, as, as Scripture says. They just come and, and lap at God's pool for a little bit, and then they run out, and they go, go, go back to their ways. And, and as, a, as a steady follower of Jesus, sometimes you can get really frustrated at people like that. Do you know what I mean? Am I the only one? All right, y'all say amen if you're, I'm not the only one because I don't know if that's where you say amen. But you know what I mean. That's a, but the reality is, is as the steady follower of Jesus, that's the biggest challenge is not to become religious, not to add burden to the grace of God. Isn't that hard though sometimes? Because they're idiots. If they would just, I mean, I'm supposed to honor them, but man, they're just, that's from last week. But if you, if you, if they would just do the right thing, they would get different results. And man, they just keep in the same. And it's so frustrating sometimes, isn't it? <laughs> there you go. Now we're talking. We're going to get hankies waving here in a minute. But the reality is, is this undeserved grace of God is still there. And it's not fair. It is not fair. If it was fair, we would all not get it. That's 
So it's a good thing it's undeserved. Because you at your best, me at my best, cannot live up to God's standard. This is why it's beautiful. And what challenges us is when we see this free gospel, it seems like it's getting taken advantage of. We become like the older brother in the, in the prodigal story. <laughs> like, are you kidding me? He's wasted all the grace you've given him, and you've given it, and, he ke- and, and, and here he comes again, and now you're even going to spend more money on this guy. You're taking the best of the best, and you're, and you're doing it to the guy that just wasted everything, and here I am. I've taken this grace, and I've been a good steward of this grace, and I've like, lived for you, and I've given everything I have to you, and this chump just shows back up, and he just keeps getting it over and over and over again, God. So unfair. And the great thing is this, the older son is not the main character of the story. But it's the heart of the father. The heart of the father. Because Jesus said the kingdom of God is like the father. He didn't say it's like the son or the other son. He says the kingdom of God is like the father who had the sons. The gospel is free. By adding to it, In essence, what we're saying is that what Christ did is not enough. That it must need more. There must be more to this. That that, that he had to cast a wide net, I understand. But let me make it contextual for Fredericksburg. Or, 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 or let, me make it, let me make it contextual for Vineyard or for Baptist or for Americans or whatever. And, and, and what we always have to come back to is that whatever we add... Is our stuff, not God's. In essence, God's pleasure in you is not based on your performance for him. This is so important to understand, guys. God delights in you. He loves. He's proud of you. Like a kid for the father that beams, radiates when he thinks of his kid. That's how God thinks of us and his pleasure in you. This is the core of what you need to understand about God and your relationship with him. God's pleasure in you is not based on your performance for him. So we trust in Christ alone. It's not Christ plus anything. God's acceptance of you is solely based on Christ dying on a cross. It has nothing to do with you. And that's good news. In other words, Jesus plus nothing equals everything. This is the equation of grace. This is the formula that Galatians is presenting to us. That Jesus plus nothing equals everything. And when you sit in this room today, when you watch the video online, it doesn't matter how good you've been or it doesn't matter how bad you've been. God's grace is sufficient. That alone is the gospel. Amen? Amen. Ephesians 2, amen. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says it this way, God saved you by his grace when you believed and you can't take credit for this. It is a what? A gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done so that none of us can boast about it. So not only does Paul teach that the gospel is free, but he also teaches that the gospel is freeing. That it's not just a free gospel, but it is a freeing gospel. This is why we call it the good news The first way that we're free is by his grace, we are free from sin in this world. This is why in verse 4, he says, Jesus gave his life for our sins, just as God our Father planned, in order to rescue us from this evil world in which we live. This is the gospel. Even though we didn't deserve it, and we still don't, God saw fit to send a son who was the only worthy sacrifice to die on a cross and rescue us from our shackles of sin. 
So the gospel says, you are free. When you put your faith in Jesus, when you give your life to him, he now in exchange takes your old ways, he takes your old shackles, he takes your old bondage, he takes all the things that you could not escape from, and he breaks those and he exchanges it for freedom. And that's all it takes. Now, it doesn't mean that sin disappears, right? I mean, like, anybody say a prayer to give their life to Jesus and, like, no sin ever again? No, no, no. I, yeah, me neither. Uh, sanctification's a lot of work. But what, it, what he's doing is he's saying, but it doesn't have to have power over you. Now, you actually have the option to be free. See, because before Jesus, if you did something bad, that was now your identity. If you stole something, you're now a thief. That is what you're branded for the rest of your life. You committed adultery, you were an adulterer or adulteress stamped on you for the rest of your life. That is your identity. Your sin becomes your identity. And now when the New Testament comes and Jesus comes and he says, no, you are now free from that, he now says that is not your identity. So stop claiming that as your identity. You know what? You stole something once. doesn't mean you're a thief. You're a child of God that's broken that now has to live under the grace and the forgiveness of God. And that means go and sin no more. Hey, you, you're an adulterer. You've adulterated. Is that the right word? Whatever it is. You, you know what I mean. You, you did it. And, and, and <laughs> that's not your identity. We're not stamping a letter on you. We're not like... We're not branding you as this evil sinner. No, you're a daughter, you're a son of God that made a mistake. Now you need to go out and walk out in the grace and the forgiveness and go and sin no more. That's the difference. And then if you can operate out of those, that place, if you can operate out of the place that, you know what, when I'm starting to crave that, that addiction, when I'm starting to crave that thing that just makes me feel good inside, but I know it's not God's best for me, when I'm, when, I'm, when I'm in that, I actually have the power to say no, as Romans says. I, that, that, that God has given me the power to say no to all ungodliness. The gospel says you are free. There's no addiction. There's no habit. There's no chemical, there's no drink, there's no person, there's no depression, there's no anxiety, there's no power on hell or earth that can keep you bound if you choose freedom. When you make Jesus your Lord and Savior, you receive his grace that he freely pours out, which says that you are no longer a slave, but you are free. What if... What if we could truly operate from that place? Think about, and we're not going to have hands raised, so please don't. <laughs> Think about that thing you go to to self-medicate. When you're not feeling good, whatever it is other than Jesus. It could be alcohol. It could be nicotine. It could be chemicals. It could be, it could be porn. It could be getting on Amazon. It could be a lot of things. It could be flirting with people that's not your spouse. Whatever that thing is, you can be free from that. You can be free from that. That's the gospel. That's the grace. God's not appalled by it. He doesn't think you're dirty because of it. He's not like, oh, there he is. The idiot's doing it again. No, no, no. He says, no, 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 you don't have to live under that. You don't have to go to that thing that, makes you, that, that, that you self-medicate with. You, you don't have to keep chasing that. You can be free from that. It does not have to be the one that you go to when you need help and when you need hope and you need peace. He is the one that gives grace and peace, and we keep chasing peace and other things. Well, I only feel peace after I've had a couple of drinks, Joel. I only feel peace. I only feel relaxed. Man, I've had a tough day. Don't I deserve this? We can all make as many great excuses as we want. 
And you can always find a buddy or a friend that will agree with you and make you feel okay about it. But what God's grace says and what, Gal- what Galatians and Paul says through Galatians is whatever is not God's best, he has given you the grace and he's given you the freedom that you don't have to live under that. As much as your body might jones for it, as much as your, 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 your hormones and your emotions might, might say you need this hit, you need this thing, Jesus says, hey, I died on a cross for a reason, and it's not so you have to go to some other thing to get a hit, but that I am all that you need, that my grace is sufficient for you. And if we can find that place, if we can learn how to say no to the temptations in our life, if we can learn how to turn off the things that keep us bound, we know that what Scripture tells us is that there is nothing in hell or earth that, has, that separates us from the love of God. So not only are we free from the sin of this world, but by his grace, and this is my last point, and we're going to get into some ministry and then worship. By his grace, not only are we free from sin, but we are also free to share his grace with the world. If salvation is free and his grace is sufficient, Why is scripture full of directions of what to do as a believer? Because now you've received that grace. And because it's such a game changer in your life, surely you want others to experience this freedom as well. Right? Like nothing in the New Testament should feel like a burden if we truly walk with a heart of gratitude of what Christ has done for us. It it should just be overflow. I mean, it should just be a natural, like, why wouldn't you want to serve others? Why wouldn't you want to evangelize? Why wouldn't you want to give to what what God's doing? Why wouldn't you want to financially support what God's doing? Because if this changed your life, surely there's so many people that are caught up and they are bound by so much addiction and so much depression and so much anxiety right now. And that God, the king of the world, came down onto earth. He didn't have to, but he chose to because he loved us so much and he made a way where there seemed to be no way. And surely because it's changed me, I know that it could change some others that I know. So, man, I'm not going to think of myself. I'm not going to think of this as religious duty. What I'm going to do is I'm going to lay down everything because all of it is worthless compared to the riches of knowing Christ. The grace of God. The gospel. Joyful heart. A changed heart. An overflowing heart. A heart that says, once I was lost, but now I'm found. Once I was bound, but now I'm free. This is the gospel. This is the setup that Paul has for all of Galatians. But you know, we can't dig into anything else that Galatians says without starting here. So why don't we stand? So his grace is free, undeserved. It's not free. He actually paid for it. It cost him everything. It's free to us. And he gives it undeservedly. So what that tells me is it doesn't matter how many times you've had to ask for it. It doesn't matter how many times you've turned your back on it doesn't matter what you did last night that God's grace is here this is the gospel let's pray come Holy Spirit
to save a wretch like me. Thank you for this good news that I don't have to live in bondage. Thank you for this love and this mercy that gives me what I don't deserve. that place when it was so fresh when it was so new when it felt so powerful God would you bring us back to that place